Morning. Great to see you all. We are in the second part of our series in the book of Judges, which we kicked off last week. And I hope that those of us who were here last week were able to take some time during the week to, to reflect on, on what God was saying to us. I, I want you to just for a moment use your imagination with me and imagine that things are going really, really badly. Uh, and maybe for some of us, we don't have to imagine too hard. It's like, well, things are already going really badly. But I just want you to imagine for a moment a scenario where things are, are really bad. Your friends, those close to you, are, are going down a path that you know is terrible. They've been warned. They've been told if they go down that route, it's going to be it's going to be difficult. There's going to be pain. There's going to be trouble. And you feel that there's something in you that can make a difference. You feel that you could be used to change things around. In fact, when you think of the past, you can remember a moment in your life when you did some courageous things. You can remember a moment in your life where you took a stand, where there was an opportunity to make a difference, and you stepped out and said, use me to, to make things better. This time, however, it's, it just seems that things are so much worse, and you're ready, and you expect that the call will come. You're not quite sure when it will come, and when it comes, you're not quite sure exactly where the strength to do what is required will come from. But you believe that somehow you will get that strength. Somehow you'll be able to, because in the past, somehow you did. The story of the book of Judges is one whereby what seems to be ordinary men and women are called to do what seem to be extraordinary things. In the midst of things going from bad to worse, a spiral of things going from what is terrible to being what seems inconceivable, moving in this direction downhill and downhill. And these men and women in the book of Judges are available. They are willing to be used to make a difference. And this morning we will be looking at the first of the judges that is mentioned, and that's Othniel. Othniel. So if you have your Bible, please turn with me to Judges chapter 3. And we'll be reading verses 7 to 14. And this is what the Bible says. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Aram, Naharim, to whom the Israelites were subject for eight years. But when they cried out to the Lord, he raised up for them a deliverer, Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. The Spirit of the Lord came on him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. The Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Aram, into the hands of Othniel, who overpowered him. So the land had peace for 40 years. 
until Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. Getting the Ammonites and the Amalekites to join him, Eglon came and attacked Israel. And they took possession of the city of Palms. The Israelites were subject to Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years. The theme of the Israelites forgetting God and serving other gods that we called idols last week, if you remember, this was introduced to us, and we continue with this theme today. And while this theme was given in somewhat broad terms last week, this week we get somewhat specific looking at the account of this first judge, Othniel. Othniel was the first clear leader over all of Israel, as it were, after Joshua. The Israelites did evil in God's eyes by serving the Canaanite gods. Last week we, we met Baal and Ashtoreth. This week we're introduced to Asherah, who was the mother of Baal and the mother of many other Canaanite gods. So the Israelites are in this environment where they are surrounded by these foreign gods, these idols, and they are worshipping them. You may recall from last week what we said about idols. We said idols, they don't have to be a, a statue or, a, or an image. An idol is anything that we take and we, we make it more important than God. And idols tend to set themselves up in our hearts. That's the place where idols tend to latch on. The heart is deceitful above all things. It's deceitful in one way in that it is the place where idols want to take root. They want to take hold of us. And notice that the relationship between the Israelites and the idols is one of service. It says the Israelites served these foreign gods, the Baals and the Asherahs. In the Bible, the word serve and the word worship are interchangeable. They mean more or less the same thing. To, to, to worship and to serve carry a very similar meaning, which is why uh, Jesus said, you cannot serve both God and money. What was he saying? He was saying, you actually cannot worship both God and money. You, you cannot have a divided heart. If, if you choose to, to worship, to serve God, and at the same time choose to worship another god another an idol what will happen is your heart will be compromised your heart will will move in that direction and in that direction and ultimately you'll have to choose one or the other so to serve is to is to worship and where does it happen from well it happens from it happens from our hearts once we give our service our worship to to another God, it distorts our relationship with the true God. So the Lord's anger burned against the Israelites and this, this burning, it's like an oven. This burning is like a furnace that is getting hotter. It's getting more intense. And when God's anger burned against them, what did he do? Well, he sold them into the hands of this king of Aram, Cushan, Rishathaim. And his name actually means a uh, cushion of double wickedness. This was a, this guy was bad news. And, and it's God who allowed this. At the human level, as we observe, if you were in that 
area at that time, as you would observe, you'd have said, wow, the, the Israelites are, are being invaded by this, this king of Aram, which was pretty far. Interestingly, um, the, the commentators place Aram around Mesopotamia, which is where Abraham, uh, the father of the Israelites, had originally come from. But you would have been saying, this is, this is fascinating, that the Israelites who had victory after victory over Canaanite god uh, kings, over Canaanite empires under Joshua, now they're the ones that are being subject to this, to this king from far away. But what was happening is it's not just a human thing, it was a spiritual thing. Ultimately, it was God who was in control. It was God who sent this king against them because of their idolatry. So when we, when we observe things with our human eyes, it's always good to take a step back and, and say, God, what, what is going on here? What does this mean in, in, in your eyes? What, what's the story behind the story as it were? God was at work and they were subject to this king for eight years. The Israelites cried out to God, Lord, we need you. Lord, we're under oppression. Hopefully in crying out to God, God, we are sorry. We, we, we've gone after other gods. We've gone after idols. God, God rescue us. God, we've come to our senses. God, please deliver us. And, and how, how many times do we come to that place where we, we, we find ourselves in a difficult place and we, and we say, God, help us. And that's, that's an appropriate response, isn't it? God, we need you. God, please deliver us. God, we, we, we realize that the error of our ways. And, and what does God do? God, God raises up Othniel. And he sends Othniel as a, as a savior, as a deliverer. Who was this Othniel? Othniel was from one of the 12 tribes of Israel, the tribe of Judah. It's not certain what his name means, but likely it means Lion of God or Strength of God in Hebrew. Othniel was the younger brother of Caleb. I don't know if some of you remember Caleb. Caleb was Moses' friend. When, when Josh, sorry, was Joshua's friend, not Moses' friend. He was Joshua's friend. When Moses sent the 12 spies to spy out the promised land, one from each tribe. It was only Caleb and Joshua who came back with a positive report. They're the ones who came back saying, man, the land is good. All the other guys were like, there's giants in the land, it's going to be difficult to get. But these two guys, Josh and Caleb, they, they saw the promised land with faith. And this guy... Othniel was the younger brother to Caleb. So he had experience with, with seeing faith. He had experience with having an older brother that had, had stepped out and done some things for God. In fact, when we read in uh, Judges chapter 1, there, there's a time there where, where, where Caleb, still alive before, before that whole generation of, of Joshua's gone, Caleb's still alive and 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 Caleb asks for someone to, to put up their hand and go take some enemy ground. And it's Othniel, his younger brother, who says, yes, I'll do it. And uh, the reward was marrying Caleb's daughter. So Othniel goes and he, he's successful. So he, he's not only Caleb's... Um, younger brother he also becomes Caleb's brother-in-law which is a bit awkward I mean I think it was okay in that culture at that time it's not okay in our culture now we, we don't marry our brother's um, daughters do we so this is this is Othniel Othniel 
Othniel was able to defeat this king of Aram who had subjected the Israelites for eight years. Why was he able to do that? Why was Othniel able to defeat Mr. Double Wickedness? Well, the first thing that's mentioned, two things are mentioned. The first one is that Othniel had the Spirit of the Lord upon him. When, when the Old Testament speaks of the Spirit of the Lord, it's speaking of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the ways in which the Holy Spirit is referred to in, in the Bible. As Christians, we believe there is one God, and this one God is three persons. There is God the Father, there is God the Son, and there is God the Holy Spirit. And each of these three persons is fully God, but there is one God. That's what we refer to as the Trinity. We, we don't find the word Trinity in the Bible, but it's, it's everywhere implied in, in the Bible that there is one God and he's three persons, each of them being fully God. And that's one of the persons in, in the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. And, and we read that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Othniel to be judge of Israel, to lead Israel, and to go to war. In the Old Testament, there are several instances where the Holy Spirit came upon specific people to do specific things that God was calling them to do. Here are some examples. In Exodus 31, Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. Numbers 28. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit of leadership, and lay your hands on him. 1 Samuel 16. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. So we see Othniel, the spirit of the Lord came upon him. And actually we'll see this theme repeatedly in the book of Judges, how even in the midst of this really desperate time in the history of, of, of Israel, the Spirit of the Lord was still at work as God raised up people, as God empowered people to, to redeem his people, to do the work that he had called them to. So here we have in the Old Testament specific situations where the Holy Spirit would come upon people to do things that God had, had called them to. The Holy Spirit is somewhat mysterious in the Old Testament. There's, there's a sense in which you think there's going to be more. And, and the prophet Joel actually alludes to this when he, when he prophesies about how there's a coming time, there's a future time when, when God would pour out his Spirit on all flesh. And, and that, that time comes comes later, it comes in the, in the era of the New Testament, in the era of the early church. So following the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes upon people in, in greater measure. Jesus said that his disciples will receive power when the Holy Spirit would come upon them. They will receive power to be his witnesses in Judea. But not only in Judea, but all the way to the, to the ends of the earth. Let 
on the day of Pentecost. Some of you may be familiar with the day of Pentecost. It's in the book of Acts. Um, after the Gospels, we get to the book of Acts. Following the departure of Christ, the day of Pentecost comes, and, and on that day, the Holy Spirit filled the believers, filled those who were following Jesus, a group of some 120 or so believers. Verses 3 and 4 of Acts chapter 2, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. This was what Jesus had said. He said, you will, you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and Jesus didn't actually say you will speak in tongues. He said you will be filled with the Holy Spirit so that you will have power to be my witnesses. So uh, my reading of scripture is that the main point for Jesus wasn't so much that they were going to speak in tongues, which is, which is a good thing, but that they would receive the Holy Spirit to do something for God, to do something for Jesus, to be his witnesses, to have the, the, the ability to, to step out and carry out the mission of God in a broken world. By the time we get to Acts chapter 4, that the church had grown considerably. The Holy Spirit continued to fill the followers of Jesus. In verse 31, it says, After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. In Acts chapter 8, something fairly significant happens because up until now, those who were being filled by the Holy Spirit were actually Israelites. But after Stephen had been killed and the, and the church scattered, the, 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 the walls of the church went beyond Jerusalem, beyond the, the Israelites. And, 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 and what Jesus had said about the gospel going to other peoples began to be fulfilled. So, so the gospel now gets to Samaria through Philip. Philip preaches the gospel there and, 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 and Samaritans come to faith in Christ. News of this is sent back to Jerusalem. Oh, the Samaritans have received the gospel. Yes, amazing. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to send Peter and John down to Samaria to go and encourage and see what's going on. And in Acts chapter 8, this is what it says. When they arrived, uh, Peter and John, they prayed. See this thing of praying, the Holy Spirit prayer. They, they, they go together. They prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Paul tells the church in, in Corinth, in this Greek city, that each one has a gift from the Holy Spirit. This was a church that there was actually some amount of confusion with regards to the Holy Spirit and the there was some abuse of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he doesn't say, stop using the gifts. He, he kind of helps them to see how best to use the gifts in a way that glorifies God and builds the church. And in verse 7 of chapter 12, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And he also tells them that they should eagerly desire gifts of the spirit in 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 chapter 14 verse 1 follow the way of love love is so foundational for us as christians i mean without love we're, we're really nothing and and once you follow the way of love what should you do well eagerly desire gifts of the spirit especially prophecy so we live in the period after jesus rose and ascended to heaven a period where we have greater access to the Holy Spirit than those who lived in Othniel's time, than those who lived in that dark time of the judges. John Stott said this, 
Before Christ sent the church into the world, he sent the Spirit into the church. The same order must be observed today. We need the Holy Spirit. Othniel was empowered by the Holy Spirit. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, he could, he could do great things for God. The second factor that allowed Othniel to defeat the king of Aram is that the Lord gave him into Othniel's hands. Othniel had God on his side. God fought for Othniel. Amen. When God calls us to do something, there is going to be a fight. When God calls us to do something, there will be a battle. How are we going to enter into that battle makes a lot of difference. Who we have on our side makes a huge difference. And if we have God on our side, that's the thing that turns everything. Because if we go into a battle and all we have is ourselves, all we have is our ideas, all we have is our experience, even if that's good, that's not enough. When God is saying, I'm calling you to this, I'm calling you to that, we also need God to come with us and say, hey, I'm going to fight for you. Because there will be a battle. There is an enemy. There is the devil who will stand against everything that God is calling us to do. There is our own sinful nature, our own sinful ways which are contrary to God's ways and, and our sinful ways are, are opposed to the mission of God and what God wants us to accomplish for him. There is the ways of the world that surround us, choking at everything that God is trying to do. There are worldly systems and ways of thinking that are out to make us unfruitful, unproductive for God. And if we are only going out there in our own strength, we don't stand a chance. We need God to fight for us. We need the Holy Spirit and we need God to fight for us. The Christian life is a life full of battles. If, if you're living the Christian life and it's, it's battle-free, we, we've got to ask ourselves, maybe, maybe we're living the wrong Christian life. Because the Christian life is one that is full of battles. Yes, there's victories. There's times of overcoming. But there's only victory after a battle. There's only overcoming after you've, you've had to go through something. And what makes the difference is that God is with us. In Second Chronicles, this large army comes against the people of, of Judah. And, and Jehoshaphat is, is king at that time. And the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel and he prophesied. And this is what Jehaziel said in chapter 20. Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. They had to put aside fear. 
They had to put aside discouragement. They had to march. They had to find their enemies. They had to take their position. They had to stand firm. And when the time for battle came, they, they sang praises. So the battle being the Lord's doesn't mean that we just sit back. It means having, having faith and actively trusting in God. And, and God fought for them as they sung praises to God. As they lifted up his name in praise, God sent ambushes into the enemy camps. And the enemies began to turn on each other. The battle is the Lord's. Othniel was able to go to battle because God was with him. What are you facing today? What challenge are you facing today where you are facing it on your own? Where you are facing it as if all you have is yourself. We need to realize that the battle is the Lord's. Yes, we must take position. Yes, we must stand firm. Yes, we must pray. Yes, we must praise. Yes, we must play our part. But the Lord is with you. He is fighting for you. After Othniel defeated the king of Aram, there was peace for 40 years. 40 years. That's a, that's a long time. During this time, it, it appears the Israelites were not worshipping idols. They had cried out to God and he had saved them through Othniel. And for 40 years, they followed God. But what's, what's interesting is that it, it, it looks like the, the faithfulness of Israel was linked to the life of Othniel. Othniel delivers them. And as long as Othniel was alive for this next 40 years, these guys were faithful. So it, it makes you wonder, were they really faithful to God because he is God or Somehow, was it about Othniel, the man of God, who had saved us? And once Othniel, the man of God, was dead, well, we're back to our old schemes again. It's quite sobering. I want to end with seven application points. The question I'm asking us now is what does this all mean for us? Well, the first thing is this. We need to search our hearts. What are the things we are doing where we need to cry out to God? Things that displease God. Where have we forgotten God? What are the things that we need to repent of? You see, the, the Israelites came to a place where they were desperate. They're like, God, we're crying out to you. And, and, and change doesn't actually happen. True change, superficial change can happen, but true, lasting, fruitful change does not actually happen outside of saying, God, I repent. God, I'm crying out to you and I'm saying sorry for these things. I need to turn away from them. So, so what are the things in our lives where we need to say, God, I'm crying out to you? Secondly, we should pursue the leadership opportunities that come our way. 
I love this story of, of Othniel because you can actually see the progression. When he was younger, he wasn't even married at the time. He was, he was going after God. I mean, the incentive was to get a wife. Fine. Okay, that's, that's not a bad incentive. But he was, I mean, he was going after God. He's like this young guy who's going to go for us, an opportunity to lead, an opportunity to do something. Yeah, I'm, I've got my hand up. And, and that pursuing of, of, of leadership opportunity was God preparing him for something in the future. So, so if, if there's things in your path, even if they're small, even if they seem insignificant, go for those things. Pursue those things. Put your hand up. Here in the church, in, in the marketplace where you are, where you are working, hey, say, I, 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 I can do that. I, I have some ideas on that. No one else is bold enough to give that a try. I, I believe God can help me. In your community, there's so much opportunity to, to lead and to serve and to, and to bring the light of God. Hey, I, I'm going to put my hand up. Preparation for things to come. During this week, I've been out of Dar es Salaam and what tends to happen when I'm out of Dar es Salaam is I, I tend to have a little bit more time just to be still before God. And I was walking through a through a forest um, some days ago and I was, I was praying and, and I felt God say to me that he, he wants God's tribe to be a, a church of influencers. I felt God saying that he's raising this church up to be a church of influence in the arts, in, in education, in, in politics, in media, in, in in business, in the economy. He's, he's wanting us to be a community that influences. And, and, and the thing with influence, influence is not, well, I've got a big title, so now I'm going to sit here and show everyone that I have a big title. That's not influence. Influence is using whatever opportunity God has given you to move people towards God, to move people towards righteousness, to move people towards God's kingdom. That's influence. That's what Othniel was doing. So, so I, 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 and I feel this is, this is like a prophetic word. Remember we're talking about the Holy Spirit. I feel like this is a, a word of prophecy to us as a church. That God is calling us to be a church of influences. I haven't even had a chance to check this with my fellow elders. I hope they'll agree with me. Maybe they'll scold me a bit late and say, hey, we should have spoken about this first. But I'm so excited. It's kind of on the back of this message. It seems to fit. I do feel that God is saying we, we should be trusting him for influence. As servants, of course. Not lording it over. So take those opportunities to be an influencer. For the glory of God. Third application I think we need to ask this question. Who do we actually have faith in? Is our faith in God? Or is it in a person? If certain leaders were to die today, would we still continue to follow God because he is God? Because we have a genuine love for him, a genuine relationship with him. There are too many Christians in the world today that are wrapped up in a leader that are wrapped up in the man of God or the woman of God. And, and when the, the woman of God falls or the man of God falls, whether it's, it's, it's moral failure or, or, or something of that sort, or, or they die, it's like, well, are, are we still going to have our own faith in God? Do we have a sincere, genuine relationship with God for ourselves? Or does it depend on some leader? Yes, leadership is good. God has given it as a gift to his people. But let's beware of what was happening with the Israelites where it's like Othniel dies and, well, the whole thing just goes south again. Fourthly, what does this mean for us? We need to trust God for the battles we are facing. I won't say much on that. I've already spoken on that at some length. Let's trust God for the battle Fifthly, we all need a savior. Like the Israelites, the Jewish people, 
we have all done evil before God. In other words, we have all sinned before him. We have all missed the mark. If, if that's kind of the mark of where we should be with God, if that's where his holiness is, where his perfect standard is, if that's there, every single one of us has, has fallen short of that. Just by nature, as well as by our action. We need a savior. And, and we, need, we need a savior not from, not from political bondage per se. You see, the issue there was there was a spiritual bondage to idols which led to, to political bondage to the king of Aram. The, the deeper issue, the issue that's really important for us is we need a savior from bondage, not to a political thing, a political leader. We need a savior from bondage to sin. That's what really enslaves us, is sin. In Romans chapter 3, verses 22 and 24, this is Paul, uh, he's writing to this church in Rome. It's a church made up mainly of non-Jewish people, but there's some Jews in there as well. So it's a, it's a, mixed, it's a mixed community. And this is what he says to them. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So what does this mean for us? Well, it means that the savior we need is Jesus. Jesus is quite like Othniel. Jesus is also from the tribe of Judah like Othniel. Othniel is called the, the Lion of God. Jesus is also a lion. He's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Othniel was, was filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. After his baptism, the Bible says in, in Luke chapter 4 that he, he went into the wilderness full of the Holy Spirit. And after 40 days there, he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit. And as he starts his ministry, he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the good news to the poor and to proclaim freedom to the captive. Jesus is the greater Othniel. And he's the savior that we really need. Othniel brought freedom for peace for 40 years. Jesus, our prince of peace, he brings eternal freedom. He brings freedom for forever and ever and ever. So have you accepted his free gift of grace? For the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus died on the cross for us. Jesus bled. Jesus gave his life so that we can have peace with God, so that we can be part of God's family, so that we can be in right relationship with God. If you haven't received Jesus as your savior, if, if you can't say Jesus is master of my life, Today's the day when you can say to him, Jesus, I, I surrender my life to you. Forgive me of my sins and, and become Lord of my life. Maybe you've been coming here for weeks and today's the day you can say yes to Jesus Christ. And finally, we can play a part in God's plan for salvation. This is exciting. The Holy Spirit is available to empower us to reach people with God's word. The Holy Spirit plays this very vital role in empowering us to do what God is calling us to do. Who are the people in your world who are the people in your sphere of influence that God is saying, I want to use you to reach. I want to use you to, to bring truth.
true freedom to. We need the Holy Spirit to be able to reach them. And we need to understand that we, we, we don't go into the battle on our own. The battle is the Lord's. But we can, we can stand up and say, hey, listen, we, we've, we've had some victories before. We, we've done some things in the past. We can see there's a broken world around us. We can see our friends going down the wrong path. And, and we think that somehow God could use us to play a role in bringing his plan of redemption to this world. If God could use one man to bring peace to his people for 40 years, imagine what God can do with one church in a city like Dar es Salaam. Let's believe God for great things. Yes, things around us look really bad. But we have the Holy Spirit. And we have God on our side. And God is calling us to be influencers, to change things for his glory. Jesus has gone ahead of us. And we're following in his footsteps. Let's step out in faith and allow God to use us.